Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of Blurb's online event. We have a very special guest today in Michelle Dunmarsh. Michelle, how are you doing? I'm so well, Dan. How are you? I'm good. We're working through our technical issues and uh, and the heat his- issues here in Maine. I've got a good sweat going. Uh, it is summer has definitely arrived here in Maine. And uh, I was going to start by cherry picking a little bit of your bio from your website, because it's a pretty incredible bio for anyone who has an interest in books or photography. Uh, each paragraph of this bio is is pretty mind blowing. And I'm going to actually say some of my favorite parts at the end, because there's a couple of things that I know about you that I really like that are partially in here. But am I getting is it Pallyup, Washington? Is that Puyallup? Rem- Puyallup, Washington is, 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 uh, you're originally from there, but you consider both Seattle and New York, your home. And, um, you believe that, uh, living with books is transformative, which I totally agree with and that everyone should try it. Um, I love this. You've experienced every aspect of the publishing process through staff positions at Aperture Foundation and Chronicle Books, which for anyone who loves books and photography, those are at the top of the list. And on a project basis with University of Washington, Museum of Glass, Heyday Books, Abbeville Press, among others. Um, But you've also been the editor and designer of over 100 publications uh, prior to starting Minor Matters, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which is your own imprint. And also curated exhibitions, which is a a side of Michelle Dunmarsh I'm not sure as many people know about, but including Jim Marshall's Rolling Stone, which is a favorite of mine. And uh, you also had a pretty amazing relationship with Jim. He's one of my all-time favorite photographers. And then you were also a tenured professor at Seattle College, and you've lectured at Parsons and Yale and Young Arts. And my favorite, the Siegel School for Publishing in Calcutta, which I don't know that much about, which I would love to talk a little bit about that. And you also have a bachelor's degree in literature and art history from Bard College. As I said, kind of a staggering resume, and I'm sure that that's only partial. So thank you so much for taking time to be here with us. I am thrilled to talk about books pretty much anytime to anyone, but particularly happy to talk about books with you. Yes. And I forgot to mention your love of convertibles and cowboy boots, in particular, red cowboy boots. (laughs) That is true. That's a it's a signature to know if Michelle's in an event, you just scan across the room. And when the red cowboy boots are there, you're like, she's here. So that was one of the uh, one of the reasons that I was able to interact with people as a shy person. I found wearing great shoes was a way to kind of break the ice and meet the people you needed to talk to. That's a it's a good skill. That's another thing for somebody to to tuck into their uh, quiver of ideas for future events. Um, let's just jump right into it. I had a flashback the other day to my childhood and it made me want to ask you this question is do you remember your first book not your first photography or art book but your first book as a child you remember what that was I don't um we we read a lot of books I don't have I'm sure my parents read to me but I don't have a very strong recollection of that so much as I can absolutely visualize the bookshelf in the family room, which is the the room the kids tore up. And and the books were sort of organized, you know, most kid friendly on the lowest shelf and they sort of worked their way up from there. So we had a lot of sets of uh, the time life books of the president. Tell me why uh, Richard Scarry's What Do People Do All Day, uh, mm-hmm. which actually that one probably if I had to if I had to pick one that reflects how I move through the world, how you move through the world, constantly doing multiple things at, at, at any given moment in time. That book probably had a major, major influence on uh, just knowing knowing all it took to keep the world running. Yeah, it, that's interesting in terms of the bookshelf with the kid content at the bottom. I remember the bookshelf as well. And, and my parents collected National Geographic, which was on the bottom, which wasn't really a kid, kid, necessarily a kid thing. But I remember looking at it. But what I realized the other day was that we had Dr. Seuss books. Green Eggs and Ham was a favorite. But my mother had actually handmade, hand wrote and hand illustrated a book that she used to read me when I fell asleep at night. And where this came from, I have no idea. It was about a race car who could talk. It was like an open wheeled race car that had a face on the front and it, it would talk. And it was like the life of this car. And it just came to me and I was like, oh my God, I forgot about that. So I called my mom who's starting to suffer for a little bit from dementia. 
and my sister was there and my sister was like, oh, I remember that book too. So it was um, etched in there and I finally was able to resurrect it for some, some reason. But um, what are, I mean, that, that is probably my first connection to books, but as we get into our adult lives, you know, my, my connection to books came when I found photography. And for you, I'm curious where that started. Was it at Bard College or was it prior to that? And then how did those things lead you from Bard to places like Aperture and Chronicle? Yeah, well, I actually started making books really young. Uh, and there was a group called the Young Authors Conference that happened at Pacific Lutheran University. And I want to say it was maybe nine the first time wow. I attended that. So wow. I actually was really fortunate to be introduced to uh, to the, the process of, of writing books, of producing books. Um, I do still have those. So uh, I, I had a book and a sequel, Cola Koala. Um, <laughs> and then the sequel was Cola Koala meets President Reagan. So that oh, kind of nice in time frame of the 80s. So uh so i had been introduced to that process and so that was primarily about writing but those were illustrated mm -hmm. um which is also sort of interesting to look back on now and see that my relationship to illustrated books was really um right from the get-go and so that was always part of my life my father was a salesperson for a, a research publisher reference publisher okay and so i I was around books. I understood that this was a like there was a living to be made from this. Um, but I always thought I would be a writer. I didn't understand really what all of the other components were. I thought the only way to be a part of books was to be a writer. And it was even though I worked on your books in junior high and high school, it was when I got to Bard that I was um, working in the publications office of the college and starting to see, oh, there's an art director and there's an editor and there's a director of publications and they do different things. And they, there were graphic designers and they take on different roles. And so that was really the beginning of an understanding of all of the different players who contributed to the process of publishing. And to, to go from Bard to some place like, to a place like Aperture, which for me, coming from the classic photography education and background and also the style of work that I love to do documentary work the most and looking at the books coming out when I was in college and starting to go to the, the photo bookstore, the illustrated bookstore and seeing the name Aperture Foundation. How did that come about? Because for me, I cannot, I almost get like a jolt of electricity every time I hear that name because of what it represented to me coming up as a photographer. So how did, how did that happen? Yeah. I mean, it was, um, serendipity largely and a little bit of luck and then the people that I just was so fortunate to be around so Aperture was introduced to me when I took a course on the history of photography um, their books were in the college bookstore because Aperture had published Stephen Shore had published mm -hmm. Larry Fink and so the first book that I held and really felt in a in a tactile way was Larry Fink's Social Graces. Okay. And I remember at that point I had been learning about graphic design professionally. So I had a better understanding of the materiality and paper and printing. And so holding this book and really like running my hands over it and seeing the tonality to the paper, it was on a very warm paper. And noticing uh, the name of the person who designed it, Wendy Byrne had designed that book. And that was a visceral connection. And so, and I, and I looked to see who had published it. So the name Aperture was introduced to me at Bard. And then my first semester of graduate school, um, I, I was in a graduate program that is in the business of publishing. It's an MS in publishing. Wow. And my uh, professor, my Friday night professor, my very first semester was Steve Barron, who was the head of production at Aperture. And, you know, I just moved to New York City. I didn't know anyone there. And so just this point of connection, right? He says, oh, I work with Aperture. And I'm like, I've heard of Aperture. Um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was silly because I was so naive as to the world of photography and how big and significant it was. But that course on book printing um, and production was just, my eyes were open to so many things and I asked him so many questions and I annoyed him so much 
and my friends because it was a Friday night class and I was always like staying after. Um, but he took me out to lunch and I, I wrote about this in my book, but he took me out to lunch and said, I, I this is it. Like ask every question that you want to know the answer to because then I'm kind of I'm kind of done with you. I'm, I'm kind of yeah. done. You get one last chance. I can't believe anyone showed up for a Friday night class, let alone I stayed mean, after. You guys right? must have been no. you were you know what that screams to me is book geek. You were definitely geeks. The, the cool people I are know. out of clubs. I mean, the thing that I loved about the program at Pace is that it was taught by people who worked in publishing. Yeah, right? that's... So you were working with seasoned professionals who had, you know, 30 plus years in the business and just loved sharing the knowledge of publishing. And so C was, was definitely, you know, one of those people he taught because he wanted the next generation he cared about his craft and he wanted the next generation to know and realize that beyond interns, this was a very direct way of doing that. But he ended up advising my thesis. Uh, and then, you know, he eventually hired me at Aperture. And the two photographers you mentioned earlier, Stephen Shore and um, Larry Fink, Larry those, Fink. Those, both of them were at Bard, which was one of they the reasons. Teaching, yes, they, they were is teaching still the Bard. head of the, the photo program. Um, Larry is, I think, professor emeritus. He's not teaching actively anymore but uh but that he was teaching there up until a couple years ago so and then chronicle came uh how long were you at aperture i was at aperture um in a variety of roles over 15 years wow that is uh that's incredible and then you went from there to chronicle and then uh and chronicle how was if you could just sum it up in a nutshell i mean obviously a different publishing house but chronicle and aperture and chronicle uh is it was it the same type of positions that were you in and the same type of task just doing different style of books or different um, genres of books or was it very similar to what you were doing at Aperture? So uh, Aperture is a nonprofit publisher and we can talk a little bit about what that means when the, the goal is um, sharing information as opposed to necessarily making money from the sharing of that information. Chronicle is one of the largest still privately owned um, book publishers in the United States. They publish uh, three to 400, maybe 500 books a year. They publish a lot of books. Wow. Aperture by comparison, published like 30 books a year. Yeah. Um, so that scale wise, that was a huge difference. Um, my roles at Aperture specifically on the books because Aperture publishes a magazine and does a couple different things. My role on the books was primarily as a designer. Okay. And when I started at Chronicle, my role was as an editor. So I was okay. engaged in choosing projects um, and then working with designers on the books. And so it was, it was a bit, uh, it was a, it was crossing a line in some ways professionally um, that was a little bit unusual. There aren't that many people who came from design and went to editorial or, or vice versa. Okay. Um, so I was managing about 30, 25 to 30 titles uh, with one other editor and- wow those books, you know, th those books needed to make from a, from a business standpoint, Aperture looked at projects as how can we break even over a two year period? Chronicle okay. looked at projects as how can we earn 20% over what it's costing us to make this in six months? Okay. Very different dynamic. So wildly different business points of evaluation for the decisions around yes we're going to publish this book or no we're not i have a question later that this is really about sort of the the book and how it functions in an artist's career at least superficially because i think there's a misconception about how books work but i want to sort of take a different tangent here for a second which is and this is based on the fact that i'm i'm in front of one two three four screens right now i've been on the computer all day long doing interviews we're talking, we're in production meetings and manager, uh, you know, marketing meetings and talking about social media and events like we're doing right now. The screen is basically front and center in our lives all the time. And I get questions from people because I, like you, I always am talking about books and print and tangibility and those things. And I had somebody write me, this was a couple of years ago now, and I, I love YouTube for the comments. And I think troll comments are the best thing about YouTube, but I also love the fact that people just ask all kinds of stuff. And a guy wrote me and said, you know, basically, um, you're so out of touch. 
this is the digital age. No one cares about books. And I was like, mm, not exactly. And so for, in your words, why is the tangible physical book still such an important artifact? I think for the same reasons, okay, bear with me with this analogy. For the no, same no, reasons ahead. that we're afraid, we're afraid of cockroaches, right? Okay. We're afraid of cockroaches because of a primordial element in us when dinosaurs were larger than we were and we were scared of the large creatures. This is a little creature that's left over from the dinosaur age. We're still scared of it, even though we are bigger yeah. now and it can't hurt us. Good point. Books, books hold this visceral, sacred, culturally valued, important element in humanity. Right? Mm. For thousands of years, the information that was documented as we as societies moved from oral tradition into documented traditions of anything, whether you're talking about the hieroglyph uh, on papyrus or on the walls of a pyramid through scrolls in China, I mean, around the world, when things moved from an oral tradition to being held, mm -hmm. whatever was holding information had great value. And the book became a portable way of that very important information. And so we, we bring this like depth of human uh, existence and, and history and tangibility without even being conscious of it, right? It's just kind of there. Somebody puts a book in our hands. It's also one of the first things that we Ta in a tactile way as children it's like you have a stuffed animal and you get a you have a book like you might have yeah. a blanket you know, there's like very few objects that are the first things you touch that are not a person and books are one of them so I think all of those things we don't you know we don't spend a lot of time talking about that part of why does every person want a book or why does everyone believe they have a story in them but that's really relevant, right? Yeah. We all want some part of the knowledge of what we've lived or work we've made to be held in these vessels because our humanity tells us that that makes it important. Yeah, there's a couple of things. For me, you know, the book just is the, the signifier of knowledge, whether that's visual knowledge or written knowledge, written history, those kind of things. And the other thing that it always makes me laugh and is that when I go to someone's house, especially if it's a little bit fancier, a little bit higher end house, there always tends to be that table with the art, art books, the architecture books. It is like a part of the installation of the house itself, even though those books may or may not ever be opened. It is like a critical part of the process of, of, and that to me is that reference to exactly what you're speaking about. It's that reference to how, how far back in history this object has been a part of us, a part of our species. And um, yeah, I love it. I think that that's, uh, I feel exactly the same way, slow, tactile, and uh, not just talking about photography in particular, but just in general uh, with books. I know for me, when I, I spend most of my time in the van, traveling around the country and there's a shelf in the van that has some books on it. And my wife is always like, do we really need to take those? Because odds are you're not going to read those on the, uh, on this trip. And I'm like, I kind of need them there. They're just a little bit of a little bit of an anchor for us there. So uh, another, another little shift here, and this is about photography in particular, but I think it was Jerry Badger said photography is a story best told in book form. And I think you have obviously worked on hundreds of different photo book in particular projects. Why is that statement is it accurate in your opinion? And if, if so, then why so? Well, I think as a person who also lives with photographic prints um, and feels strongly about the object, uh, the print as an object, yep. I'm not going to entirely agree that oh. photography is uh, really? because my relationship and certainly starting at Aperture, my relationship in making books was understanding the book as a reproduction of a work of art. Right? Okay. So the print, the photograph, the, the essence was 
the photographic print. And at our highest level, we were still approximating this other thing. One of the reasons that I think photography holds so well in book form is one, it's a, it's, a book is a one-to-one -one relationship to the photograph. Uh, it can be. Um, and so as opposed to a three-dimensional object that you have to take a photograph of to then put in a book, when I started making books, we, we were holding, measuring, sizing actual photographs that were then being sent off to be re-photographed to end up in the book. So there was somehow a um, dimensional closeness between the print and, and book form. And then I think the other part of that, which emerged early is the way that we experienced photographs in, in newspapers, in magazines, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, the photographer didn't really get the opportunity usually to choose the images. Mm -hmm. And so, the making of a book became a way for the, the visual author to participate in guide, lead in many cases, how the story should be told, right? From their, from their images. And so I think that element, and it took me a long time because I did start out working with photographers. So when I started designing catalogs or editing projects, that were for artists in other mediums. And that happened with Chronicle. I was surprised actually how different it was to make a book when you were dealing with paintings or when you were dealing with sculpture. Uh, because often the person in charge was the curator, not the artist. Mm, interesting. Or an art historian. It was not the, the making, the driving force was not the person who had made the art. And coming from Aperture and coming from an environment where we worked really closely with the photographers, um, they, they were definitely the authors of the book. There was not an external author. They were the authors. And so I think that's something that started really early in photography. I mean, I think that started, I don't know, in the 1920s, maybe earlier than that. But I can certainly think of, you know, Versailles and some other books, the early photography books that were being driven by the photographers mm -hmm. and, and not by people, you know, sort of external to them. And I think too, you said something really interesting to me, which I hadn't really thought of before, which was that you were basically working from the basis of the photographic print was the foundation of what would lead towards that book. And I think for me, because I studied photojournalism in particular, and I'm not a great darkroom printer, I never looked at the work as being uh, art. You know, I looked at it as journalism and it was always like a single image as part of a story. And to your point, as a journalist or photojournalist, very, very rarely did you ever get the opportunity to like say, oh, you guys need to run those eight photographs because they'd be like, uh, no, you're going to get one. And then they would choose it. And so my first real, I feel like explosion into photography came when I happened to go to Half Price Books in Austin and I opened Telex Iran. At Gil Perez's book, Telex Iran. And I was like, what is this? That was sort of my entryway into it. And so when I, when I heard that quote or read that quote somewhere, photography is best told, in, best told in book form, I was like, oh, that fits. But from your perspective, I totally get that. And that gives me a very different perspective on sort of the foundation of how you work and, and how that book comes to be, which is fa fascinating. I've never thought about it coming from that direction. Well, I think... It's something that we've moved away from so quickly that it's easy to forget. I mean, it's easy for, for good me. Point. To forget. Good point. Good um, point. You know, I, I, I have to push photographers to make prints what? when I'm working on books with them now, right? Like people just are like, okay, here's the high res files and off and running. Oh, no. And <laughs> it becomes this kind of element of if I haven't physically seen the work, what am I, what are we, what are we working toward? Um, and so, so that's become a process where I've had to remind myself because, because I, I started with that. So I start with that mentality, but that's not everyone's mentality. And so I'm finding at this stage of the game, 
I'm I'm also having to say to people, no, you you need to you need to show me what this looks like as a print. Um, we have a, a wonderful, interesting situation right now where uh, a book that is being published in Minor Matters, the photographer did not have high res scans. And so we're, we're doing it totally old school. Like the physical prints were sent to the separator. Oh, I love that. Photographing them. Um, and so there's something really that's not Kalsa's that's the crystal clear Western waters book. And, and that's, this is a project from 20 years ago. So it also feels right that yeah. we're, we're doing it the way that we did it 20 years ago. I love that. I love Prince to the separator. That that's fantastic. That, that gets me excited about um, just seeing that book in general. So that to me was, was uh, you know, that was such a cool part of the process that I, I love even thinking about that now, because to your point, I, I mean, I'm in a world where I, I work with a lot of people who are new, new to bookmaking, a lot of people who have never made any kind of publication of their work at all. And a lot of people who've never printed a single image. You know, if you grew up with a cell phone or mobile phone in your hand and you may not, it's just natural. You may not have ever done that. So uh, to get people to move in that in that path is pretty pretty interesting, and I always love it when people are like, "Dude, it's the digital age, but you don't really need books." And I'm like, "Well, I don't think maybe you necessarily know all the different uses of the book, but is there something about the physical viewing distance of a book that makes that is important to the process of consuming the book? Is that am I on to something here, or am I delusional?" Well, I think. There, there are two things. There's certainly, and I told you I was going to like pull stuff out, but there's, uh -huh. you know, there's, what is the difference between something that has like this scale of physicality and something that has this scale of physicality and, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're different. Right. Yeah. And so they, they, Rachel Demi's book has this kind of monumentality that is appropriate to touring with a rock band and being on stage. I mean, the whole, the totality of this is about the monumental, sometimes the monumentally mundane, right? So to see it scale uh, the quiet of sitting in a bus and to also see it scale being up on a stage and performing in front of thousands of people, that is a different experience than quiet intimacy about cultural experience right and so That's one right. of these you might want to like hug in a cuddle different way book then cuddle. you hug this but like they're both huggable but one All is books are huggable. superior for, for huggability um, but certainly from a design perspective yes what is you know what is the scale of the typography for instance relative to the size of the book like you don't want teeny tiny type in a practically 10 by 13 book, right? Like you've got a lot of, you got a lot of real estate. So how are you going to use that real estate? And I think that's one of those cases where people sometimes say, Oh, you only make small books or you only make X books or you only, you know, it's like, there's always this, like, it's like, no, there's no formula. You have to look at the work. You have to look, you have to look at the bookness of the book. What is it you're trying to say here? And what is the right way for it to live in the world? And so when I talk with photographers about this sometimes, um, sorry to make a generalization, but there are there are a lot Go of ahead. men who want the want a big book. Yeah. That's what we do. That's like a starting place of like, what's the largest book I can make? <laughs> That's not always what best serves the work. Not at right? all. No, no, I, I and, 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 go ahead, go ahead. No, no, it's, 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 you know, there are times where that scale is important because there's a logical reason for it, that it better serves the work and a reader's view of the work. But there are other circumstances where actually doing something small and your, so many of the books that you've made are prime examples of that, that they, they, their object quality increases because they're small or because they're on a particular kind of paper because they're paperback in a slipcase instead of a hardcover, you know, all of those different things. And so I think that is one of the most exciting parts of the process of publishing is like, what, what are we making? What is this gonna be? And 
how does it, you know, how does it emerge forth in the world? Well, it's funny because I get a question. This happens every couple of months. Somebody reaches out, typically in a panic, and they go, what's the biggest book I can get? And what's the maximum page count? And I now, uh, 10 years ago, I was I would entertain that question. And now the vast majority of the time, I just write back, don't do it. Like, don't, you, you, prob <laughs> you probably don't need that. If, if that's what, you know, there's so few books of that size that I see that are effective. There's an agency that every year publishes a book with Blurb that, uh, beautiful and it's huge and it's they use the maximum pages and they have so much work coming out of this agency it makes total sense but most of the time um, no but you you said something a minute ago that I think is fascinating and we're talking about it already but the bookness of the book choosing a paper choosing a trim size how the words and images play together sit on there are there if you go back to your early book history and you fast forward to today are there trends in that regard that have continued or is everything up in the air now? Because when I go to places like Photo Eye in Santa Fe, the range of book that they have on the shelf now seems to be, and maybe I'm imagining this, but it seems to be far beyond what it was a decade ago. Just meaning in terms of sheer quantity? Oh, size, shape. And, you know, I see a lot more what I would call art books than I did like a decade ago. At least the volume of those seems to be much more prevalent than it was a decade ago. So instead of necessarily every photographer trying to do a similar kind of like, you know, hardcover coffee table style book, there's a lot of smaller art books, a lot of more um, lo-fi materials, a lot of books that I would consider more, uh, a little bit less professional in a way, but also potentially more endearing because they feel like there's a personality and a, and a personal aspect of them that maybe some of those others did not have. Well, I think we're definitely seeing, um, I don't want to say a peak, but we're seeing the results of 20 years of the process of self-publishing just getting easier and easier and easier. So for people to be able to self-produce books and, and push them out into the world at a period of time where, where that was happening predominantly through traditional publishers, through institutions who were, who were uh, putting price tags on those things. Right. Yeah. So they were seeing, you know, there's this period of time. If you look at the, I would say the Nazareli is always a great guide in terms of um, a smart publisher who can be looking at what is the market bearing and, and how do I respond to that? So who at, at the time that he was making Todd Heido's like, I don't know, 14 by 16 giant books mm -hmm. was also making the one picture books that are five by seven, you know, single color exterior, no image on the outside, but included a print. Those, those price points were wildly different and the cost to produce them were wildly as mm -hmm. more and more people get into publishing who don't necessarily know all of those things, right? And then they get presented with, oh, that idea that you would like to realize is going to cost you $95,000. Then people yeah. start to be like, oh, maybe They're like, smaller, oh. lighter, different. Yeah, it could, maybe yeah. I have a different vision for what this could be. So I think that part of what you're seeing in the bookstores are more people just entering the arena and trying trying different things. And then you see how self-producing books and artist books then feed what publishers are looking at and saying, oh, well, that's interesting. How did that come to be? Or is there an audience, you know, is there an audience for that? Is someone buying that? We don't really know, but it's out there. So maybe we should look at that. So there are definitely trends. You know, there was a period of time where in order to be an art book, it had to have a uh, matte lamination. Like that was the <laughs> defining, like you would never, you know, everybody wanted their covers to be matte laminated. And it's, it's like, well, actually it's a solid black cover. It's gonna look terrible with matte lamination. It's not gonna look black, it's gonna look gray. Doesn't matter, it needs to Gotta be matte because that's what it means to have an art book. And so, you know, there's still a little bit of that association when I, I, there are books that we've made that have gloss covers because it makes the photograph look better, you know, and, and, and to, to gently suggest that be like, okay, it's still an art book and it's going to look better because of this decision. How do you feel about that? There's still always a little bit of a hesitation. One of the things that I've noticed recently, uh, 
from being at a photo book fair, a lot of covers don't have images. Yeah, I have noticed They're that. They're typographically well. driven. And I think that that's definitely a trend that we're in. It's something that I've noticed that we're, that we're in right now. Um, it's not necessarily something I feel like I need to participate in, um, but, but it is something that I've noticed and I'm curious about it. I'm, I'm curious about what's driving it. And I think that some of that has to do with more people getting into publishing and a kind of fascination with the materiality. It's like when I discovered mm -hmm. super paint, you know, when I could draw digitally on the computer for the first time using simulating a spray can. Oh yeah. I thought everything should be written in spray can. I mean, yeah, no, no, I get it. I, I agree. That's a, that so is a solid I think, moment. You know, I think some of what we're, what we're seeing is that it's like, wow, you can foil stamp and you can deboss and, 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 and great. Let's, Let's roll with it. Let's do it all. Yeah, the 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 type only uh, or no no art on the cover books. I have also noticed that as well. In fact, I saw an image earlier today of of a, a wall of books, and there were quite a few that way. And I just actually got a book like that that I really like. And now that you said that, I didn't really think about it when I got it, but I was kind of like, huh, that's interesting. It's the title and the and the author, and, and I love the book. And the book has an insert, you know, inside and in the insert is color and the book is black and white and it's beautifully done. But a part of me was like, when I saw it, I thought, man, this work is so graphic. Why is there no image on the cover? And it sort of haunted me. It didn't take away from the book, but it kind of made me wonder what was what was happening here. OK, so moving on a little bit here, there's this idea that I want to try to cover here that I'm not exactly how to sure how to say how to say this, but growing up. And even through your adulthood, we fall in love with novels, with literature. You know, I love The Razor's Edge, Somerset, Somerset Maugham. That's a book I reread pretty much every year. I reread uh, Blood Meridian. I reread Rum Diary by Hunter Thompson. These are books. At the same time, for many of us, we have similar relationships with illustrated books and with art books. And you've said, you've said uh, at times before where people will be visiting your house and they'll tell a story and you'll say, Oh, you know, you should see this book and then reference an illustrated book in that way. Is, is there, is it the same as a, as a liter book of literature or is it different? And how do these books like connect back to our lives? I think it can be if you allow it um, to go back to your uh, very important point of, you know, where do illustrated books live? They live on the coffee tables of very fancy homes, never to be touched, right? Yeah. Just to be there as uh, an indicator, a marker that this is a home of cultured people because they have illustrated books on the coffee table. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I am sometimes on a, on a personal crusade to sort of fight against that and encourage people to actually open those books and to love those books and to live with them and read them the same way you just described of returning to a, a novel that you appreciate or um, other other books of, of poetry that you know people will frequently reference. Um, it's also something that I saw happening as more people began collecting photography books on a kind of serious level of, oh, I wanna build a collection of books the way that they would build a collection of art that what, what made a book valuable was its perfection, right? It was it's, oh, it's brand new and, and there's no, the corners aren't bent and you know, the spine has never been cracked. I'm like, I feel this way about old cars, which you also know, like, yes, that book was made to be read. Yeah. It shouldn't have more value because it's never been opened. It's like saying, oh, this car only has 2000 miles on it. It's like, that's a piece of machinery that was designed to move. It shouldn't increase in value because it's never done the thing it was made to do. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> so, so there's a part of me like when I, so my copy of Telex, or I hope you bought the copy of Telex around that you saw in half price books. Um, I'm going to decline to answer that, but, okay. but I, but, but someone made up for it later in life by doing me a solid. It, it took me, uh, 
I, I only acquired that book, though I've known that book for a very long time. I only acquired that book very recently. It, it is a book that is known for falling apart. That is actually, it, it's known for that. Um, so, so the copy of Telex Iran that I purchased, the, the cover is basically completely uh, separate. It is no longer glued to the interior of the book. That makes zero difference to me. In fact, it makes it more valuable. You know what that is? That's a convertible now. That's, that's a convertible book. <laughs> yeah, mine is too. Mine, mine is worn. So I did not buy the Gilles Perez book. I bought because it freaked me out. I didn't know what to think because I hadn't seen work like that before. And I was just kind I mean, of in shock. Enough. Yeah, it's I put it. I was like, I, I they weren't teaching like, us that. Pick it up, put, it, put it down. I put it down. And right next to it was another book by another Magnum photographer. And I bought that one. And it's a fine book. And I like it. And I still have it. And I look at it. I have two copies of it now. But the, the Telex Iran haunted me forever until I told everyone I know this story. And a friend of mine who was in the process of moving and was downsizing and was getting rid of all of his books, I went to his going away party and he asked me where my truck was. And I said, oh, it's parked over there. He goes, back it up over here. And he proceeded to load into my truck the wow. most mind-blowing collection of books. And he, he made sure to know that right on top was uh, Telex Iran. But his copy, he was not like a book collector. He was a guy who absolutely loves photography more than anything else. So they weren't protected. They weren't in any kind of plastic sleeves or protection material. This was a book that had been looked at and viewed. And I, I call it the Fabergé egg book syndrome where everybody wants a Fabergé egg, but nobody wants to leave it on the coffee table when their friends come over. And for me, the point you made is exactly the point of the books I make. I want you to look at it. If it wears out or it gets coffee stains or whatever, that's part of the life of that book. And I don't want it to sit on a shelf that people are afraid to look at it. So I love that point. That's right spot on. Well, and that's, that goes back to, you know, extremely large books that we come into the element of the slipcase, you know, and the limited edition and adding a print and all these things. And, and again, there's a little bit of this fascination of, of course, it's beautiful when you can make a slipcase. And as a designer, it's really fun to do that. And as a person who's interested in production and to think through like, oh, this part can be this, and then we can wrap it in this and there will be a ribbon and you know, there are times when it's, we just published a book last year that has a slipcase, Nicholas Glenn and Never Forget. That's an accordion book. If you mm. don't encase it in something, yeah. it, it will just expand, right? So that is a case where the slipcase serves a purpose. It holds the book together. I'm not a huge fan of slipcases. Like in that case, the accordion book was the absolutely right design for this work of art we needed scale it gave us scale in in a, in a book yep uh but again that comes back to what what does this need to be what is this asking to be and making the decisions from that origin point not i've seen this really cool thing and i want to make that yeah that's a it's a really great point what does this need to be um, and, and again, I think a lot of folks come from the opposite side, um, and instead of looking at that foundation and saying, what is it, what does it actually need to be? Um, a couple of things, because there, there's a couple of things I want to make sure that you're, that you explain, but I have so many questions I want to ask you. And I know that we're never going to get through half of these, um, very, very briefly, even though I think this is important, but very briefly, I think a lot of times, at least in my experience, photographers will come, and this is kind of all range of people, but people who are driven to do a book, a publication. And there's often this idea that the primary goal of a photography book, and, and not necessarily a story-driven photography book, but an, a, a book about the artist, he or, uh, about themselves and sort of the quality of their work, there's this idea that there's going to be this massive print run, and they're going to sell tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of copies of these books. And I think what gets lost in the shuffle sometimes is what, how a book can be strategic without being sold in high numbers. And can you just give a couple of examples of how an artist would use a book in addition to trying to actually sell the book? Yeah, I mean, one, the thought process of completing a body of work, right? So having, having this vessel, having a container, like if you are going to deliver what you've been doing for five years or 10 years or 30 years into some form, this is a, this is an accessible, tangible, portable, uh, energy efficient form. 
right? You don't have to plug it in. Yep. Yep. And so the thought process that goes into, I'm going to take all of this work that I've done and place it here. Books, because they hold cultural value, when people see images in books, it gives them a sense of, of importance, right? So if you're trying to sell prints or if you want uh, that as a possibility, maybe not even selling, if you're interested in someone exhibiting your work at some point in time, a book is a great way to, again, use that um, subliminal subconscious notion of value when they see that image in a book and then they see it on a wall, they're like, wow, this is important. It's in a book. Yep. Yep. And it does, it, that does work. I mean, it's why galleries have started producing catalogs where they wouldn't necessarily have done that for, uh, for an eight week exhibition because people seeing it in a book is like that little gentle encouragement toward buying the actual work of art. Uh, so that's another, you know, a way that it can be used. It's a, it's a way of showcasing your work um, that again is, is more visibly appealing than someone pulling out their phone. Oh, like yeah. I have a completely different physical relationship. It's also about letting go of control, right? When you're holding your phone and you're scrolling through, you're not allowing a reader to have their own experience. Whereas in a book, if you hand someone a book of your work, you can try to tell them how to look at it, but they're not gonna listen to you. You know, if they're a book designer, they're always going to start at the back of the book. Or if they're left-handed, they're going to start at the back of the book. Or they're, some people are flippers and other people are like very carefully and look at particular spreads. The most important part is you're not in control. You're letting someone else experience your work. And that's probably in terms of what you can do for your career, maybe the most important thing you can do. Is that is a great, somebody else experience your work. That is a great point. I always joke with people, you hand a book to someone, they flip through it in chunks and then hand it back to you and tell you how great you are. And they never really actually looked at it. And oftentimes people start from the back. And I don't think the physical consumption of the book is something that a lot of people take into consideration because the assumption that they're going to sit down at a table by themselves with you know mood music on and start at the front and go through the whole book is just not accurate. And so I think that that point you just made to me is is one of the most important things that you could have said that that you cannot control how they're going to experience. And I also think the book is confrontational because they can't really do anything else at the same time. And so because we're so used to multitasking, a book feels like, oh man, I got to stop what I'm doing and like pay attention to this. And that's exactly what the artist is after in the first place. Right. right. Undivided attention. Okay. There's two things I want to talk about and I don't, I want to do it before we run out of time. Number one okay. is tell us about minor matters. Minor matters is uh, a publishing imprint that my colleague, Steve McIntyre and I started almost 10 years ago now. And it came out of a desire to make really beautiful, tactile, thoughtful books in collaboration with the readers. I've been collaborating with the authors really in every process of publishing. This was an opportunity to take a step back and look at who else is involved in a book. Um, and the audience of a book matters to the existence of the book. And so we develop projects with visual authors and then we present them to the world. And if we can get collaboration through purchase from 400 to 500 people who say, yes, this is a book I want to own, I want to participate in, I wanna be a part of, um, and they purchase that book in the pre-sales process, they are named within the book and the book goes into print. Fantastic. So four to 500 people commit, say, yes, this is a story I want to see. This is a book I want. They pre-purchase. That money is then used to, to, for the production of the book. That's and right. how many books have you done in the last, I don't know, how long has Minor Matters been around? Uh, well, we're coming upon 10 years. Whoa. Yeah. Was there a big blowout party know, somewhere? Crazy. <laughs> a huge it's party? Crazy. <laughs> Um, we th will hit book number 25 this fall. The ones that are the ones I'm working on right now. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. That's, uh, that's fantastic. And on the, the final note, you did a book recently that has a very, very personal angle for yourself. 
So tell us a little bit about that. Seeing Being Seen, A Personal History of Photography uh, is a memoir of my professional life, uh, influenced by, of course, all of the other things that, that make our lives what they are. And it's been a really incredible process. I, I ended up publishing it through Minor Matters, which I had conflicting feelings around. I realized, however, that to not run my own model was not fair to all of the people that I asked to do it. And I needed to see if there was an audience of people who wanted my, my book, just like I do with other people. And so it was scary. Um, it's like, what, how am I ever going to convince an artist to work with me if I can't publish my own book through this process? Uh, but thankfully people like you, Dan, and, and, uh, many other colleagues and friends and family, uh, put, took part in the book and it's been incredible to watch people read something that you put years of your life into. Uh, there's a lot of words in my book, which is unusual. Most of our books are very image driven. Yeah. So, but that, yeah. That book the number one, the point about how how much copy, how many words are in the book, it, that to me was one of the reasons why I like the book so much. It reminds me a little bit of Road to Seeing, Dan Winter's book about his sort of history in photography. And, you know, that thing is a massive, it's a long read. But I also think your book, it's such a good book for anyone who is interested. I don't know even how I would describe this in the, the heart of what photography actually is. It's almost like, a three-dimensional take on imagery and one person's life and how all the me- the different meanings of photography come together. And it also, there's a book called On Being a Photographer by David Hearn, which I think is a, it's a wordy book. There's not a lot of Im- imagery in that, I don't think. But I think your book is is the next, the continuation of that. I think it's a really important book for anybody who goes beyond the superficiality of photography or a technical equipment or any of that stuff that doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. I loved it. I think it's a fantastic, fantastic book. Thank you. I mean, part of my goal in that was accessibility to take people through, you know, begins with snapshots and to take people through my own progression of the importance of a family photograph and not dismissing that. Right. But understanding that it's, it's purpose is different from some of the other pieces that emerge and probably one of the both again scariest but most interesting elements was how do i help someone understand who's coming at this who doesn't know a lot about photography Mm -hmm. how photography can be and so there are 11 pictures of me in the book by different photographers and and to try and show subtly i don't really write about that but to try and show all these different people are coming at the same subject in wildly different ways. And, and that is what's so amazing about photography. Yeah, you also did an exhibition a couple of years ago in Seattle that Amy and I went to with you. And it was about your collection, your book collection and your print collection. And to me, that was like pulling back the veil. I've known you for quite a while now, but there was, there was so much I realized and learned about you from seeing you know, th- there were images there I didn't know you had. Um, being in your house and seeing the images on the wall and and realizing this is not uh, trivial decor. Each one of these is something that you have a personal relationship, not just the image, the artist, the artist's history, and how your history and their history are intertwined. And that is so rare because most of the houses I go into, I'm like, hey, what's that on the wall? And people are like, I don't know, the decorator put it there. And in your house, it was, a, it was about meaning. Every single one of these things had meaning. And that's how I felt reading the book was like, I felt like I was getting a window into the detailed history of you as a, of being in the, cent, uh, the center of the whirlwind of publishing and photography. It's again, I mean, I see a lot of books, but it's a unique book in my experience. I haven't seen anything quite like it. And uh, all of you out there, you better get it before it goes away, right? Because if it sells out, then it's, you know, it's going to be a Fabergé egg. No one will be able to get it. Thank you, Dan. It, um, <clears throat> it, it's been important uh, going back to what my mentor at Aperture taught me. The book is also my, my gift forward, right? To help people understand what goes into the process of making books, what goes into making photography books, the joys, the challenges, um, the photographers themselves and their, their lives and, and what we all create together. 
And so to hold a record of that, particularly at a time when I think a lot of things are changing and have been changing mm -hmm. and will continue to, to change. I mean, I think there's changes in there that we're experiencing that are exciting. Uh, being able to, you know, Charlie Harbutt's The Unconcerned Photographer, we published a book that is a print on demand book. We've never done that before. It's an essay oh, yeah. book. We've never done that before. And so just the opportunity to say, this allows us to take a different kind of risk because of a technology that didn't exist 30 years ago. It didn't exist when I started. And so I'm excited about the changes as much as I am in many ways a historian. Um, I'm a historian who's still excited about the future. So, What a perfect way to end this. I really appreciate it. I love talking to you. Um, I was telling somebody about this a couple of days ago. The last time I saw you in person was when you gave me a ride to downtown Seattle in your vintage Camaro, which uh, was pretty fantastic. And I said, every time I'm, I'm around Michelle, I, I walk away from the conversation saying, man, I got to go home and like study. I, I have to study. I don't, I don't know enough because it could be graphic design. It could be publishing. It could be photography. I'm always like, oh man. And that is such a motivating thing. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do this with us. Well, I feel the same way about you, Dan. Um, I hope we get a chance to teach together again because we collectively, uh, I love the fact that we both bring a lot of different knowledge to the table, but we also ask questions of each other and just model that ongoing learning. And I think it's so wonderful, the series that you're doing is, is an opportunity to bring more people through that process. So um, to all of you who are out there, thanks for, for listening and for being a part of this and, and asking questions, please ask more questions. And, um, and Dan will continue to do this and bring great knowledge forward. Excellent. Again, thank you. And um, best of luck with all the new ventures. And uh, we will hopefully catch up again very soon. Thanks, Dan.